Hello and welcome to EPG Patshala. This is Stuti Goswami. The module that we are going to do now is module number 17 and the title of the module is Do Women Peacekeepers Make a Difference? Now in this module, we will look at the role that women peacekeepers can and have played in conflict situations. The resolution 1325 of the United Nations Security Council focused prominently on the role that women could play in peacekeeping operations. It highlighted the fact that gender mainstreaming was the need of the hour and it insisted that all United Nations peacekeeping missions make it mandatory to adopt a gender perspective. This was a huge step forward because prior to this resolution 1325, questions of gender and the role that women played in peacekeeping operations had not been adequately addressed. Gender equality or gender equity was one of the Millennium Development Goals and in order to build equity and equality, the United Nations has endeavoured in various ways to follow a policy whereby more and more women are appointed in various branches of the United Nations in different institutions attached to the United Nations and in different projects. It is also tried to see to the fact that women are appointed not simply at the lower levels but also at the decision-making levels because that is actually more important because the presence of women at the policy-making or the decision-making levels ensures adopting the gender perspective in the policies and decisions taken. Resolution 1325 in its point 5 says this, quote, it expresses its willingness to incorporate a gender perspective into peacekeeping operations and urges the Secretary General to ensure that, where appropriate, field operations include a gender component." Unquote. Basically, the objective is to take the specific needs of women of various age groups into consideration during recovery period of war and conflict situations. The United Nations Security Council Resolution 1889, adopted in the year 2009, reinforces these aspects. It says, and I quote, it urges member states, international and regional organizations to take further measures to improve women's participation during all stages of peace processes, particularly in conflict resolution, post-conflict planning and peace building including by enhancing their engagement in political and economic decision making at early stages of recovery processes. Through inter alia promoting women's leadership and capacity to engage in aid management and planning, supporting women's organizations and countering negative societal attitudes about women's capacity to participate equally." Unquote. Now when we look at some of the facts and figures, what do we find? We find that in the year 2012, at the United Nations headquarters, 48% of the staff were women and 52% were men, with the greatest amount of disparity being seen at the senior levels and the middle levels also. In peacekeeping operations and special political missions, the disparity was even more staggering. With women making up only 29% of international and 17% of national staff. And it is a sad truth that these statistics have not really changed much over the years, despite the best interests of the United Nations. Section D3 of the DPKO Policy Directive on Gender Equality in United Nations Peacekeeping Operations is dedicated to recruitment and retention of high-quality personnel. And it advocates for, and I quote, the adoption of gender sensitive policies which support the increased recruitment and deployment of uniformed women to peacekeeping. Also, we have to mention here uh, that the focus has also been uh, given, particularly in recent times, uh, on uh, increasing the number of vacancies or, or in improving upon uh, the gender equality in vacancy announcements. 
In this way, the DPKO has endeavoured to increase the number of women, but it is also to be understood that simply increasing the number of women in United Nations offices or in United Nations peacekeeping operations will not suffice so long as the intensity of participation of the women is not enhanced. Also, the onus in this direction lies equally if not more on the member states or the troop contributing countries because until and unless member states adopt a paradigm shift vis-a-vis uh, -vis women's participation in peacemaking processes, no amount of resolutions of the United Nations will help. The methods followed by the United Nations to assimilate women into their personnel are clearly defined. The first step is the appointment of gender advisors in the foreign missions and adopting strategies to support and encourage the presence of women in peacekeeping operations. It is also equally if not more important to provide gender training to all personnel, whether male or female, in order to sensitize them to the needs that are peculiar to women, whether young or old, whether young girls or elderly women. Now, when we look at the importance of women in peacekeeping operations, in the essay, Women with a Blue Helmet, Francesco Bertolazzi stresses upon the need for women in peacekeeping forces because, according to him, women, and, and I quote, have an easier access to the female populations. Bertolazzi also feels that the best force or the most effective force would be a mixed one, where the ratio of men and women peacekeepers is closer to 1 is to 1 rather than 1 is to 10, as is the scenario. Also, the roles that women play in these uh, processes should not be confined to staff roles or support staff roles like cooking, cleaning and so on. But mainly, the reason why women have to be a part of peacekeeping missions is to reflect the society with which they interact to build peace and stability. Although the importance of female peacekeepers has been touched upon in an earlier module, we may lay down a few more points that highlight why it is important to have women peacekeepers or female peacekeepers in the peacekeeping missions. Firstly, the increased recruitment of women in peacekeeping activities and peacekeeping missions is essential for empowering the women in the host community. Now, whenever there is a situation of conflict, particularly in a situation of armed conflict, the social security is lost and also the societal framework is broken and this has all again been referred to in an earlier module. Now, in such a case, the women of that society not only become vulnerable to all kinds of physical and sexual abuse and exploitation, but they also lose their confidence in more ways than one. And so, the presence of female peacekeepers can instill confidence in women and can help them advance or progress towards empowerment. Secondly, addressing the specific needs of female ex-combatants. Now, the female ex-combatants have to live a harsh life in, t in times of conflict and the presence of female peacekeepers can help them come out of those harsh experiences during the process of demobilizing and reintegration into civilian life. Thirdly, helping make the peacekeeping force approachable to women in the community and this is self-explanatory I believe. Next is mentoring female cadets at police and military academies. Now, this is important because uh, it is not always possible for female peacekeepers to live permanently or for a very, very prolonged period in a particular conflict-ridden zone. In such a situation, they bring their expertise and skill and specialized training and also uh, better perspectives with them when they come into work in a conflict zone. Their presence and their training and guidance and mentoring of female cadets at the police and military academies of a conflict zone can help those police and military academies not simply adopt a gender perspective but also contribute in 
a very very effective manner in ameliorating the violences and excesses and the uh, traumatic experiences of violence and conflict. Next, interacting with women in societies where women are prohibited from speaking to men. And this of course is true for conservative societies because the men, even if they are themselves victims of war and violence, tend to uh, often suppress and silence their women and prevent them from speaking out to the peacekeepers. Now we have to understand and remember that the specific needs and the experiences of violence and conflict of women are much different and in fact they can be contrasting from that of men and therefore it is extremely essential to have an insight into the kind of experiences that women have been through in a conflict zone and that is only possible when the women speak out and they will speak out by being most at ease whenever there are female peacekeepers. Other contributions of uh, or other important roles that female peacekeepers can play include helping to reduce conflict and confrontation, improving access and support for local women, providing a greater sense of security to local populations irrespective of gender and age, and also providing role models for women in the community. Female peacekeepers act as role models in the local environment, inspiring women and girls in often male-dominated societies to push for their own rights and for participation in peace processes. Now, this is very significant because whenever there is a situation of conflict, and as I have already mentioned, the social framework breaks up, women particularly are in dire need of some role models who they can look up to with hope and faith and female peacekeepers can play a very important role in this direction. They can instill confidence in the women to come out, to speak out, to raise their voice whenever necessary and also to play a proactive role whenever necessary in the peace processes. Of course, it is another thing that this aspect is often overlooked or ignored in discourses on peacekeeping. In the year 2000, DPKO stated that, and I quote, women's presence in peacekeeping missions improves access and support for local women. It makes male peacekeepers more reflective and responsible, and it broadens the repertoire of skills and styles available within the mission, often with the effect of reducing conflict and confrontation. Gender mainstreaming is not just fair, it is beneficial, unquote. And this is from Mainstreaming a Gender Perspective in Multidimensional Peace Operations, DPKO, July 2000. However, female peacekeepers often face certain restrictions and limitations when it comes to the demands of their job. One important restriction and problem that female peacekeepers often face is that most peacekeepers are drawn from the infantry and perform infantry like tasks. Now in many of the troop contributing countries, women are not permitted to serve in the infantry and that automatically leaves women out of this whole peacekeeping activity. Secondly, Peacekeeping operations function as part of armed forces which are combat oriented. This combat orientation limits women's participation. Thirdly, many women who participate in peace missions are part of the mission's civilian staff and not the military staff and they as a consequence are often confined to the camps instead of going out to the field areas and being involved in field operations. And because of this very fact that women serve mainly in administrative, public relations, information and secretarial positions and very few occupy high level positions, their role as peacekeepers often gets limited or restricted. Now this is something that J. Bailstein speaks about in the expanding role of women in United Nations peacekeeping. Next, peace missions are often are generally set up in violent zones. Now, a lot of male peacekeepers particularly believe that the presence of female peacekeepers in their missions make them vulnerable to target attacks. And women peacekeepers are also seen to be extremely vulnerable in such violent situations. 
Now, women have some time to be excused from patrolling duties because of their menstrual problems. Now, this aspect of hygiene and privacy is extremely serious and significant whenever we discuss about female peacekeepers' activities in the peacekeeping missions. This very issue of uh, females' menstrual problems also alienates men and results often in a platoon going understaffed. Again, in groups where there are highly skewed sex ratios, that is in those uh, peacekeeping missions where the number of women is very low, they are the women peacekeepers are barely if ever visible and so their voices are generally unheard. Now, as a consequence of this and particularly in the light of the fact that women in peacekeeping missions are often involved more in the civilian aspects or sec in secretarial positions or clerical positions, what happens is they cannot affect the decision-making activities of or the decision making processes of the peacekeeping missions. And so uh, we can say that they do not really influence the group in a significant way. Another very important thing to remember in this context, and this is another of the restrictions or problems that female peacekeepers face when it comes to peacekeeping activity in the peacekeeping missions, is the fact that the kind of training that is provided to the women does not equip them or make them adept at assisting women who have been victims of sexual violence or other kinds of violence. This makes women peacekeepers ignorant of the traumatic experiences of the women victims of war conflict or warlike situation. And also another thing here to note is that uh, often women peacekeepers or female peacekeepers are unaware of the cultural dynamic of the host country or the host community. Their actions therefore might end up isolating them, that is the female peacekeepers, from the women in the host countries. All this eventually limit the capacity of women peacekeepers to make any kind of difference in their areas of operation. Now let us look at the aspect of women's voice and influence in conflict and transition settings. In such situations or in this context, we also have to understand that sometimes innovative practices have to be adopted in order to find solutions that are peculiar to a particular country or a particular community. Now, innovative practices seem to depend consistently on three factors. Firstly, advisors and program managers, both in-country and at the headquarters of the United Nations need political skills to identify key opportunities as they arise and to broker relations among the relevant stakeholders. This includes innovative ways of thinking, our thinking out of the box and engaging non-traditional partners and allies. In fact, the broader range of people being involved in such decision making always leads to better perspectives, more insight and also leads to the adoption of policies that are more effective. For example, a collaborative work between UNIFEM and the United Nations Department of Peacekeeping Operations in 2000 reveals that incentivizing military peacekeepers to consult with women on security threats in refugee and other camps is good but also it improves upon the security and safety aspects in those refugee camps. Secondly, is to identify opportunities at the country level. In order to identify opportunities at the country level, staff need not simply good knowledge of the domestic context, effective communication skills, but also the idea and the ability and the capacity to use that knowledge and those skills in the most effective manner. Communication is key to peace processes and unless and until a rapport is developed between the peacekeepers and the victims of conflict, it is not possible to make any headway in the direction of peacekeeping. Thirdly, 
technical skills and thematic expertise matter. Now, these thematic expertise and technical skills are required, but then they will be effective if and only if they are used to support the political processes that are domestically driven and owned, rather than to promote external agendas. Now, these three points that we discussed are from women's participation in peace and security, normative ends, political means by Domingo Pillar, Tam O'Neill and Marta Foresti. Now we have to understand that along with all these aspects of uh, female peacekeepers playing an effective role, we also need a vibrant local community, particularly a vibrant local women's community that can play the role of a bridge of sorts between the peacekeepers and the host community affected by violence. Probably in this context, one example that we can cite is that of Assam. Now in Assam, in the year 1915, when Assam was still under British colonial rule, Mahila Samiti or a women's committee was formed. This was the first such committee, all women's committee formed and uh, in no time, the number of such committees or samitis uh, increased all over Assam. Now, these samitis played a very important role in the freedom movement and also in finding solutions to ills prevailing in Assamese society, uh, uh, besides uh, taking up mass education and weaving projects and so on. Of course, in the 1950s, after India's independence, these samitis became apolitical in matter. But during the Assam agitation that took place between 1979 and 1985 and that took place against the illegal immigrants from Bangladesh, women's organization played an important role in social reconstruction. This is true particularly in the light of the fact that this agitation that began as an agitation only soon took a violent turn. And then in social reconstruction, in social rebuilding, the women's organizations in Assam played a very important role. But once again, these efforts are basically or often undocumented and unacknowledged. Uh, another important organization that uh, was formed in the year 1995 was the Assam Mahila Samata Samiti that not only emphasized upon equal participation of women in learning processes but that also voiced its protest against atrocities whenever the need arose. Now before we uh, wind up this module and when we are talking about Assam, I think it is important for me to mention one particular figure, one woman who has been playing a very important role in her efforts against witch hunting in the tribal areas of Assam and her efforts have now assumed the form of a movement. This lady is Birubala Rabha and over the years she has been endeavouring to not simply ameliorate this problem of witch hunting but also in preventing atrocities that are being inflicted time and again by various quarters on tribal people, particularly tribal women. Now in this module thus, we have looked at how women peacekeepers can play an important role, although the focus and the thrust has been on the efforts of United Nations peacekeepers, we also have to understand that peacekeeping is not confined to the United Nations alone. At the grassroots level in the small towns, states and provinces in different parts of the world, women have been playing, women's groups have been playing an important role in finding solutions to social diseases and also in protesting against atrocities by the state and by various authorities. Women peacekeepers from the United Nations, it is true, have a very important role to play, but their efforts, and this, is, this can be seen more like a summing up of this module, their, their efforts will not be effective until and unless the member states that contribute troops to the United Nations peacekeeping missions do not undertake a paradigm shift. Also, in the peacekeeping missions, women's problems, and that is the problems of women peacekeepers have to be taken into consideration and 
arrangements have to be made in order to enable women peacekeepers to stay in those missions, peacekeeping missions at ease without facing any sense of threat to their privacy and to their dignity. Another aspect that has to be kept in mind in this context is the training. Now, the training of peacekeepers is more in the lines of military training. And so, peacekeepers are trained in military exercises rather than in psychological understandings or cultural understanding of the host countries into which they are going to work. Another aspect of the training of peacekeepers are the simulation exercises. Now, these simulation exercises involve both training the peacekeepers to handle the media, whether local or international, and also in such uh, manners of activities as uh, playing the role of protective mothers or nurturing mothers to the people affected in violence and conflict. But along with all these, like I have already mentioned, it is imperative for the trainees to understand, that is the peacekeepers, to understand the cultural, historical, societal background of the host country into which they are going to work. Because unless that understanding is there, unless the peacekeepers are sensitive to the problems, the experiences that are peculiar to that particular host country where they are going, they will not be able to play an effective role in peacekeeping missions. Also, the women peacekeepers of the peacekeeping units need to be more united because uh, it is often said that the women peacekeepers, because they are less in number or despite the fact that they are less in number, they do not seem to have the unity because they themselves seem to have ingrained some kind of prejudice against other women, whether other women peacekeepers or people uh, or the women victims of the societies they work in. Now, all these also have to be taken into consideration when we look at the role that female peacekeepers can play in peacekeeping mi missions. Thank you.